Jeremy Murphy is the founder of 360 Bespoke, a media agency that provides the full array of public relations for clients in categories such as luxury, the arts, fashion and beauty, hospitality, travel, and that's just to name a few. And Jeremy is especially known for securing marquee media placements for a quirky collection of clients who include a violinist, a celebrity cosmetics line, world-renowned florist, and an opera star, among others. Previously, Jeremy Murphy spent 14 years at CBS, where he served many roles as a vice president, most notably as a company spokesperson and editor-in-chief. And Jeremy is here to discuss his new book, F Off Chloe, Surviving the OMGs and the FMLs in Your Media Career. So let's welcome the very skilled marksman of public relations, where the pen is mightier than the sword, and the man who may just be throwing himself on that sword, as well as under his own bus, Jeremy Murphy. Welcome to the show. Hey, I'm a marksman now. Thank you. I'm going to put that on my bio. Hey, there you go. Well, I've got to say something, Jeremy. I've been in television for 22 years, and I have become cynical and jaded because of it. But your book simply reinforced my beliefs, so I'm not sure if I should thank you or not. Well, I, I, I am looking forward to um, giving darkness and expelling hatred and scorn to the masses. I mean, and this is what I live for. You know, I'm literally on your side because I would actually love to see truth and media actually meet one another, but I don't think they're on the same page. But right off the bat, what is your media background? Well, I started as a journalist, as a newspaper reporter with Knight Ritter. I did that for three years and then I moved to New York and I actually covered media for Media Week magazine. And then um, I wish I can say that there was this grand plan or, you know, dream, but CBS came with a boatload of money and I'm like, sold. Uh, <laughs> that's really it. <laughs> well, I mean, you, you know, moving into a role like that, I mean, or were you just a glutton for punishment or did you try to, or you figured out that punishment was a daily part of the job? Well, what was interesting was I was one of the few people uh, in the PR department who had worked as a journalist. And I, I think that was my advantage because I know how journalists think. I know, I know their headline. I know the money quote. I know how to pitch them. I know, I know the culture of a newsroom because I grew up in one. So I know when to pitch them. I know uh, when to call. I know when their story meetings are at 10 a.m., I know the best time to call them is between 11 and one before they get a lunch. Like I know all this stuff. So I felt like I brought value. Um, and you know, I, I, I kind of had a PR hat and I had a journalist hat on. So um, it was great. I mean, I had a wonderful 14 years. You know, it's, it's the strangest industry and you know, it's great for me to talk to someone like you because you're the side that I, have to constantly work with. I get yep. over 50 pitches a day, 99.9% oh, can... .9 go in the trash. Yep. And, you know, but at the same time, I love working with publicists, but there's also a side of it in which I can see, well, who the Chloe's are, but at the same time, those that just, just literally just don't get the industry at all. And, and they're trying yeah. to do their best. But I want to step into your book very, very quickly because, you know, you have the title, F Off Chloe. Who's Chloe? So, Chloe is somebody who was CC'd on an email. And I had sent a very, not long, but very detailed strategy uh, plan to a client. And there were, you know, 10 people CC'd. And someone named Chloe replied back and she said, TLDR, LOL. I don't know what this means. Uh, you know, I'm old. I had to Google it. And TLDR means too long, didn't read. And I was so offended. But then I said, this is the funniest thing I've ever heard in my life. And her name was Chloe. So I, my immediate reaction was F off Chloe. And I was like, that's my book. See, I get that. Now, one of my very dear late friends was a movie director, did over 45 films, but his background was English lit. He was a professor. 
He was also one of the most renowned copywriters in the world. And one thing I learned from him is when you type out an email, there's no such thing as abbreviations. Now, if you're talking no. with a friend, LOL is okay. But when you're yep. talking to someone you do not know, you make sure your grammar is correct, the sentences yep. make sense, and you get your point across quickly and with great clarity. And I learned that. And even when I text someone, I follow that rule. Well, you know, we're losing letters because it used to be thank you, and then it became thanks, then it became TKS, then it became TU, and now it's just a smiley face. Like yeah. we've lost letters. Like we've literally, the alphabet has failed. Oh, completely, completely. And, and the thing that, and it was so funny because your book literally made me laugh as I read every page. Thank you. But for us in the media, there is so much truth in every sentence you wrote. And once I yep. read through the whole book, I literally wanted to go back and I'm going to and start taking notes of things that I didn't actually know. But there were pet peeves you brought up and you just really just started it with people are so lazy with the English language that they have to start abbreviating normal words. And I yep. think, you know, when I started hearing people going around going, oh, that's cray or cray cray, I wanted to punch them in the face. Well, first of all, can I give you the people <laughs> say cray cray? Okay. <laughs> they don't know what it means. Okay. <laughs> cray cray is not crazy. Cray Cray are the Cray brothers in London in the 60s who were twins and gangsters. And they wore the most immaculate, very stylish. They would wear leather trench coats into the Ritz London. Cray Cray. They're the twin brothers. The People Cray say brothers. Now I know who you're talking about. And what they're talking about. They think it's crazy. No, it's stylish. It's the twin brothers. Cray Cray. And see, right then and there, we have the crazy millennials and Generation Z that that can yep. literally cannot no speak. You know, my and my bit now my one of my biggest pet peeves, and is here when we w need to use the word whatever. If I hear whatevs, I literally <laughs> cringe. My skin cry. And when you had it in your book, I went, "See, I'm not the only one that hates that word." You you know what I hate? I mean, I have a lot of pet peeves. But when someone says, in fact, comma, what, as an error? Really? Or this has to be strategic. No, I prefer dumb. Really? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Now, describe for all of us the change in culture from pre-Chloe's to now. Well, I mean, it, so there's a lot to unpack there. Um, I'm fascinated by, you know, writing is not no longer required it's not it, like i get the most insipid uh not only typos but sentences that just have no verb or uh not capitalized or omg lol um in an official document mm. and i'm like and my, my other favorite is you know you get overly officious chloe's who, who, who think they're smart and they'll send a press release. And at the end, there's a privileged and confidential. You're sending a press release. <laughs> you know, the, oh, yeah. I this? mean, the only press releases that I deem as like, well, they're all important for the people who send them out. I get that. But when I get the ones that say, do not post until such and such a date, I get all that. You know, yep. and of course, to me, why don't you just send it on the day that it could be released and just save yourself a bunch of time? <laughs> yeah, we call, but, that, we call that embargoed. And basically, that is kind of a strategy where if you're giving a reporter kind of a heads up, so you know, you're going to announce the news on a Monday at nine, their story's already written, so they can just post it at nine. So I do that, I get that. Yeah, well, that, it, it makes sense, it makes sense. Yeah. And you know, it's just, you know, with, you know, with your side being public relations, my side is providing a platform for people like you, who you want to, you know, you pitch me the clients and then I look at them and, you know, a lot of people don't understand the difference between a yes and a no. A no means I never answered back. Yep. Well, no, no. The new thing is, 
Um, we don't have bandwidth right now. Okay, if I hear that one more time, I'm going to scream. And you know what? I thought, I'm going to have a telethon, and I'm going to raise bandwidth. No, forget hunger, forget hurricanes, natural disasters, coats. The, these people don't have enough bandwidth. We need to raise this because yeah. without bandwidth, they can't do their jobs. So I'm going to have a telethon for bandwidth. Yeah, uh, yeah. And the excuses, you know, I love the part of your book where you broke down what an actual term or sentence means in media. And yep. Uh, gosh, I'm trying to think right off the top of my head. Uh, oh, we're going in a different direction, meaning the CEO got fired. Yeah. Or um, left to pursue other opportunities. Fired. Or, right. Or, or the one that does spending more time with his family. Yeah. <laughs> Which means is uh, we investigated his expenses and he put his uh, uh, mistress on the company. Yeah. Exactly. And and once I were read through that list, I was like, oh, so it, it really, you know, your book makes media very clear, hopefully even to the lay person. But yep. uh, seriously, when I, when I did the intro for you, do you feel that you're falling on your own sword here and canceling yourself out? Oh, completely. Completely. You know, I feel like I put on paper what everybody else is too afraid to say, but they're thinking it. And I am just stupid enough to put it in a book. So, you know, uh, uh, so far the reaction has been really good, but I know there's going to be some very, very progressive group or some coalition or uh, rights group or some academia. It's going to pillage me and say I'm a horrible person, which could be true. Um <laughs> But um, yeah, I mean, this is probably the end of my career, so that's why I hope people buy it. What, <laughs> well, need- there, there was after I read literally, uh, Jeremy. I read every chapter. Thank I you. I took my time reading every line because I like reading about media, but I love reading about public relations because I deal with so many publicists, and I have yep. publicists that I absolutely love. Yep. I don't think I've come across one yet that I actually hated i haven't got that far but after 22 years you know there's a few that you know you send out a maybe you send out a pitch sometimes i send out a pitch you know mm-hmm. because i want a particular guest you know i think if i if you're going to turn me down i get you know if you're not going to answer me back i get that but when you answer me back what i absolutely love is the kind decline i love I, that I, because they would, actually read it. You read it. Um, what I don't like is we don't have the bandwidth right now. But <laughs> See, I, I've never heard that. And it's so well, funny that's because. A that's a Chloeism. But I, I, I absolutely agree with you. When a journalist says, thank you, uh, I, I'm not interested or I can't sell it. Like a, a truthful, reasonable reason why they don't want to do the story warms my heart. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I have, you know, I've had some where I have contacted agents or publicists in Hollywood, and I literally save the kind, uh, the de- you know, decline or some of, and I love it when some of them come back and go, the time is not right. And usually, I know that that's very, very true in Hollywood. Timing is everything, and I only, I've only received one absolute no from one of the biggest movie stars in the world. And I literally saved it just so I could tell some people, oh yeah, so-and-so Lish flat told me no. <laughs> you know, because I kind of laughed about it. But, uh, you know. Uh, young uh, people starting the business is yes. journalists are your client. Clients come and go. The journalists you will deal with are there longer than the client. That is who you're serving. You're giving them good stories that, align with your clients, but they're more important than the client because that is your relationship. And the worst thing you can do is burn them or um, sell them something that's not true, try to spin them. You know, that's your more important relationship to the client. Yeah, you know, and and that's what I, and Jeremy, that's what I found out about your book is that there are areas of your book which is really self-help 
to those yeah. who are a publicist or those who are thinking about getting into that industry. And I think they need to use your book almost as a rule book. Now, where you fall on your own sword is some of the names you mentioned, which I was really surprised about. Um, I'm not going to mention the full name, but you kind of just threw the name out, Anna. And when I read that chapter, I'm like, really? You put that chapter in this book? Actually, I thought it was very flattering because the one thing about her that I've learned is Vogue works like a Swiss watch. It is the most efficient magazine in publishing. That woman is such an amazing manager. Meetings start either early or on time, 15 minutes. There's no bullshit, bull, whatever. <laughs> yeah. uh, it is so precise. And when you go in there, don't babble. Um, be interesting. Don't pretend something you're not. Um, don't ask for things. You know, she'll tell you. If she, by the way, when people give you your resume, she already has it. All right. She's interviewing you. You don't need to hand her anything. Right. And I actually thought she will find it. I, I think she'll find it flattering because I actually wrote it in, in in a place of earnest. I really thought I was so impressed when I was talking to people about how this woman interviews people. And I said, I'm going to put this in a book. And I do think it's flattering. You know, I, you know, I always have the utmost respect for the toughest people in, yep. in particular industries. You know, so, you know, the media wants to portray them as, you know, being the devil wears Prada kind of thing. Right. But those are the type of people that we can learn from. Yeah, there's always ruthlessness in every yeah. area of business and every genre, especially in media. But we can take nuggets from that and learn and grow and become better. I just don't think the Chloe's of the day actually have the ability to learn anymore. Well, no, because, you know, they're, they're so sensitive and they'll call HR if, you know, you tell them to do their job. You know, I, when I started CBS, I remember I had a, a very tough boss. And my first day, he said, welcome to the NFL. And it was the NFL. I mean, you were dealing with the top of the top, Les Moonves, Nancy Tellum, Nina Tassler, smart, incredibly smart people. Um, but you had to be on your A game. And you learned really quickly. If you go in a meeting, you better be prepared. You better know your stuff. Uh, you be presentable, um, quick, um, flawless. And if you weren't, you would hear it. And it really trained you. I mean, these people are so smart and they're so good at their jobs. And, you know, if you're overly sensitive, then you're screwed. So it really gave you, it gave me a very um, uh, thick skin. And so now there's nothing you can say that will phase me. I really, I, I get garbage thrown at me all the time. It, you can't hurt me. I've already been hurt. <laughs> well, how long did it take you to actually form a thick skin? Probably a year. Probably a year because I wasn't used to it. Well, what's you know, the mental was, process? What's the mental process for you that, or for anyone that doesn't have a thick skin yet? What's the mental process of trying to actually get one? Well, I always equ uh, equate it to joining the Marines because you go in there as your own self and they tear you down and then they build you back up, which is basically military training. You know, you go in there as a new recruit, they shave your head, they tell you how awful you are, they train you, whatever, and then they build you back up with pride and a sense of duty. And, you know, you're you're not one person, you're part of a group. And it really was like that. Well, um, in, in public relations, or well, let's say just media in general, and, and this is just focused upon you only, were there any mentors going through the industry and where you are now that uh, really helped you learn things that uh, you probably wouldn't learn on your own? Oh, absolutely. One of my, uh, one of my best mentors is Kathy Black and she ran Hearst magazines. She started Oprah's magazine. Um, she ran Hearst for, I think 12 years. 
she was the first publisher USA Today. And she is so honest and so kind with her time. But I remember when I started my company, I brought my business plan. And I was very happy because it had charts and graphs and like, yay. And I sat, and I really was kind of hoping she'd look through it and say how great I was. Uh uh. She tore through it. She demolished it. The best advice I ever got. And really? she's such a great mentor to me because I only get honesty from her. And that's what you need. You don't need a cheerleader. You need somebody who will tell you you did a good job, but when you do a good job. Well, you know, it's kind of like, uh, you know, there's a saying in the government, you know, once they hire you, they can't fire you. But right. in public relations, with all of these Chloe's on board that don't know Jack and mm -hmm. think Instagram is, you know, the best media in the world, yeah. how do you get rid of them? Or, or is there a way to train them where they're, where they're going to they're gonna be useful? No, you can't get rid of them because, you know, they have a private line to HR. And if you, you know, look at them the wrong way, you'll get written up. And I just say, you know what? You're going to work for her. Chloe is going to be your job eventually or, or be your boss. So uh, resistance is futile. <laughs> <laughs> well, my favorite chapter in your whole book was page after page of truth bombs. And you yes. wrote a chapter called What the Media Cares About but they really don't. And yep. my gosh, I could have just sat there and applauded every bullet point on that page. I'm Thank like, you. finally, somebody is pulling the sword out and literally going to work. And that's the chapter to me. It's a little dangerous. Don't you think? Yeah. I mean, the whole book is dangerous. I mean, honestly, and I, I'll, I gotta admit the book was written during COVID, I was very bored. I was very drunk. It was late at night. And I just said, you know what? F all this. And I just put stuff on a page. Like there was no, I didn't do a proposal. I didn't have an agent. I literally just like, it dripped out of my fingers. And I know every starving writer, every struggling writer hates me right now because I, I literally wrote these lists, you know, after, you know, lots of McAllen. And I posted them on PR czars. And then I got a book offer like in a week because I, there's truth to it. It was completely unvarnished. I, I didn't even think about it. Everything I felt, I just wrote. And I think that's why it kind of struck a chord with people, you know, because there yeah, was no, there was no, uh, agenda here. It was, it's pure, um, you know, visceral, unvarnished raw it is and you know you mentioned the pandemic and you know a lot of people sitting at home during lockdowns depending on where they lived in the country uh was that a slow time for you that oh, maybe was, uh, like literally um business just changed overnight like i went from a very high billing to nothing okay nothing for four months i had no income my and, gosh yeah and um so i had nothing else to do well so wait wait a minute you... well let me ask you this jeremy because okay four months no business is it based yeah. on the fact that some of your clients let's say the ones that are uh recording artists because they can't tour all they could do they is tour. record they can't tour you know my my most of my clients are um lifestyle uh, beauty honestly like Beauty, who needs beauty when you're wearing a mask, right? Um, lifestyle, my artists aren't performing. Uh, restaurants are closed. Uh, theaters are closed. Museums are closed. Like, no one needed PR. So, obviously, you know, the dirty secret in, in marketing and media is, you know, when things get tough, PR is the first thing you cut because companies don't value it. And so it's the first line item. Uh, we'll get a PR. Get uh, we'll cut it. And so that's what happened. Well, did it make you? Did it make you rethink some things on the type of clients that you have? And did you change to go after certain clients that you knew that you could promote during a pandemic? 
Um, well, it taught me to diversify. It taught me that I can't have all kind. I can't have everything in one basket. So I really had to, okay, lifestyle beauty, but let's go after like technology, like apps or new platforms. But from a consumer positive, like I never want to take someone who's hurting people. I always want to take a client who is benefiting, either making people happy, beautiful, stylish, you know, improving their lives somehow. Like I don't do crisis control. I don't defend companies if, you know, they're polluting waters or like selling cigarettes. I just don't do that. I, it's just, I have to sleep at night. <laughs> you know, it's funny because crisis, crisis management is something that a lot of PR companies will not touch with a 10 foot pole. But part of me is like, maybe because you're not trained in it and it, and you're in fear of it. For me, I think it's kind of cool. And well, cool is the wrong word. Um, I think that some people absolutely do it wrong. And I can name names. You can oh, watch their all- interviews and you're like, <laughs> what publicist allowed that to happen? Because well, you know, nobody's I, not thinking ahead. I was at CBS for 14 years and it was a master class. They were so good at crisis control. I mean, I had bosses that I was in awe of. Um, you know, our CEO was so well spoken and so media savvy. Like you did not have to train him. My bosses just knew how to shut down something. And it's very, very simple. Tell the truth. Tell the truth. Now That's all you have to know about crisis controls. Tell the truth. Say that these are the facts. We're we're cooperating with so and so. This is what we're going to do different. Tell the truth. The minute you start saying or equivocating or denying, you're screwed because journalists will find out. Yeah. And, you know, the other thing that I found very interesting about your book, besides that incredible chapter, which you basically proved the term fake news is real. Okay. Oh, yeah. And what is your eye? What is your whole opinion and thought on wokeism? Oh, I think it's horrible. I think it is tearing the country apart. And what I'm fascinated by 99% of this country does not like this. Okay. It's that 1%. It's the academics. It's the coalitions. It's, it's these private interests or public. Yeah, it, it's, it's this very small group that has a very big megaphone. And they are writing the script. And I think it's horrible. And I think the one way to um, fix this is to mock it. Because we all are thinking this. Make fun of it. Yeah. Do a Bill Maher. Yeah. Make fun of it. Call these people out for how how stupid this is. And this is my thing about wokeism. It's like some of the ideals I get. Like I'm for LGBTQ rights. I... You know, I think we do need police reform, not defunding, but I think, so I think a lot of the things are admirable. What I disagree with is you can't disagree anymore. Someone has to be the villain. Like, so you're talking with someone and if you have a different opinion, you're racist. Oh yeah, absolutely. And I don't like the militant attitude. Right. It's the militant attitude that I think has turned off 99% of the population. Look, you know, you know, there's a dividing line between liberals and, and, and conservatives, but you know, just recently, if anybody had ever saw the particular episode with Bill Maher, you know, there were liberals that came out and said, look, this is what we really believe. So what they were saying, it's almost sounded like they were conservative, but they didn't want to come out and say that, you know, they were against the, let's say certain mandates or whatever, and flat told the truth that, you know, we ourselves are in hiding. We know what's okay. what's real, but we can't say that because of a particular group. No, I live in Manhattan, uh, the most liberal city uh, aside from San Francisco, and I'm a Democrat. Most of my friends are Democrats. We hate this. We hate this. We go out 
dinner, drinks, whatever. And everybody is ashamed of this. And I cannot believe my party has embraced this. I cannot believe that, um, you know, Joe Biden has not spoken out against this because this is a wedge issue. And this is how he's going to lose the election. If he does not get in front of this and say, we've gone too far, um, we should be able to agree to disagree. Just because someone has a different opinion does not make them racist. Exactly. exactly. And not only that, you know, we're seeing where, like you said, the 1% of the media is twisting everybody's words around. And of course, I think uh, the ultimate Chloe must be AOC. Let's just be real. You know, I uneducated. And her. Yeah. Uneducated. You know, and I will never forgive her because w- regardless of what you think of them, Amazon was going to have a headquarters in New York. 30,000 jobs. Okay. She's a New Yorker. She represents, granted, she has her own district, but you're a New Yorker. She scared them away. She went after them and Amazon actually named her out. And not only did she cost 30,000 jobs, but think of that community and all the businesses around them, the dry cleaner, the pizza place, you know, the, the mechanic. Okay, if you have 30,000 jobs, you have a community around them to support them. Mm-hmm. All that gone because of her. You know, uh, this is why I really like Nancy Pelosi. Nancy's a boss. I know people disagree with her. <laughs> Nancy has no time for AOC. Nancy's yeah. like, you know what? Know your place. We've been here a lot longer. We'll listen to you, but don't lecture us. We know more than you do. Watch and learn. Yeah, and see, and, she, and AOC is a perfect example of a Chloe who's basically yep. after your job. Yep. And, and could you were, could you imagine if she was Speaker of the House? Oh my God! You know, this is how tone deaf she is. She went to the Met Ball. Okay. $25,000 a seat. She went to the Met Ball and she thought, oh, I'm going to wear a dress with a message. No, you're still at the Met Ball. Okay. The most elite. By the way, I think it's fantastic. I wish I was invited, but I'm not out there, you know, with, you know, you know, canceling people. Um, I could not believe that whoever her comms people are, what a bad decision to let her go to the most elite yet where you're drinking champagne with you know society and des- fashion designers but okay are can your people get jobs can, i don't know can can you uh revitalize your community no you're at the map ball have fun yeah yeah and you know to me if if anybody's going to put a message on their dress the only person i know that can pull that off and has always pulled it off every year is Joy Villa, and I've already interviewed her. And so right. I've seen both sides. And But again, back to your book, because there was a line in your book that, wow, I'm in 100% agreement, you literally called diversity window dressing. Why? It is, because it's, companies are not taking it seriously. Okay, diversity done right is good business, okay? Getting people of different backgrounds, ethnicities, perspective is good for business, okay? But you have to do it right. You can't just put someone and say, oh, look, we we, we started a new uh, department, uh, inclusion and culture. But unless that person has power to affect change, it's window dressing, okay? You can't just say this. And this is the problem, though. These groups are going after companies and demanding it now, 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 now. Okay, this takes years. All right, these companies have to go into school districts and develop talent, find talent, identify talent, groom them, train them. It does not happen overnight. The problem is these groups uh, target them, they protest them, and the company has to make a knee-jerk reaction now. Oh, okay, well, you know, we hired so-and-so, and uh, we're affecting change. We're diverse now. No, you're not. You just hired somebody. That person has no power. It's window dressing. 
You know, it's funny because in the last 10 years, even the Academy Awards has become irrelevant. Oh, completely. By the way, uh, you know, it used to be a very <laughs> exclusive, like, I don't know, uh, you know, five nominees. Now there's like 20. Like, uh, because of inclusion and diversity. Yeah. Now you have to have, I'm sorry, but if, if you have 20 nominees, that's not special. Okay. No. That's not curation. You're not curating anything, you're not identifying the best. It's a trophy for coming to work. Well, yeah. And when I see a foreign film win Best Picture, there's something wrong with it. Yeah. I mean, come on. We can't. By the way, that's a category. Okay. That's right. I think celebrate what we do in this country and then identify what other countries are doing. But I just think it's it's trophy for coming to work. Well, Jeremy, let me ask you this question because when I hear people in media, people in public relations, the things that they say, the things that they do, the things they create, the illusions they create, mm -hmm. how gullible or smart is the American public? Oh, they're completely stupid. <laughs> completely. You know, I was just watching uh, Fran Leibowitz, who is my hero. I love her. And she was saying that she was walking through Times Square and she saw a big line of people outside Krispy Kreme and hundreds, not hundreds, but it was a very long line. And she asked a friend and Krispy Kreme said, if you get a vaccine, you get a donut. What would it be, hamsters? You need a donut to save your life. This is how dumb we are. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Now, because you have worked so long in media and in media and public relations, sometimes I kind of separate the two because the side that I'm on. But mm -hmm. when it comes to celebrity clickbait, how much of mm -hmm. what the public reads is real versus what is fake? That's a good question. Um, I think a lot of it is spin. And we are dumb enough and we're obsessed enough to want to know what J-Lo is wearing or, you know, um, uh, Kardashian. You know, we want to know what she wore last night or uh, what's the latest with, um, you know, whatever, Kanye and her and like, him trolling whatever whoever she's dating i mean this is this is kind of like it reminds me of like the fall of rome right when the gladiator thing and that was like hey don't look over here you know society's falling apart watch people fight yeah and that's basically what's happening you know you know what and when i read these headlines you know if you're on tmz or if on daily mail i'm sitting here thinking I'm like wait 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 I don't care what so-and-so is wearing. I don't I care do. who they supposedly date or fake date. You right. know, I'm thinking you either have one amazing publicist or mm -hmm. you have paparazzi on speed dial. Oh, and they all do. I mean, come on. There's no such thing as a candid celebrity. <laughs> you know, they actually call it plandeds now. This is what millennials call it. I don't know if you've heard this term. Planded is where you planned your candid moment. So you have these you know, uh, influencers and they're like, okay, I need a shot of me coming out of Starbucks, just completely glamorous. They play on it. And then they take the photo as if it's candid. Okay. No, there are no candid moments anymore. Everything is planned. You know, if I even see a bottle in somebody's hand and the headline on daily mail is, Oh, so-and-so, uh, is, is, is coming out of Ralph's. Really? The person who owns the company, that bottle she's holding, just paid for that. Yeah. I mean, this is how tasteless it's become. I remember um, there was someone's funeral in New York and paparazzi were there. And I think it was Valentino, the PR people, put out a press release of who was wearing Valentino at the funeral. <laughs> I was just like, this is how far we've fallen, fallen. So what is your next move, Jeremy Murphy? Oh God. Um, recover. I mean, this book has literally taken the life out of me. Um, 
you know, I'm, I'm just fascinated to hear the reaction. Um, you know, not everybody's going to like it, and that's great. Uh, but like I said, you can't phase me. Like, I have such a thick skin. Um, I kind of want to enjoy the moment. Like, someone's like, whether someone buys it or not, you have a book. It's my first book. I've been, my name, the New York Public Library ordered my book. And it's got the F word in the title. So I'm very proud of that. <laughs> you know, I, when I read again, and, and I do this with all of my guests who have books, I read the whole thing. It's only fair. Okay. Yeah, oh, I, you know, yeah. you know, I have publicists who are absolutely shocked because they send me bullet points and I'm like, well, thank you for the guideline, yep. but I will work from there after well, I, I read the I, I book. So telling that a publicist is shocked that you did your job. Like, yeah. I'm sorry. I have clients who write books. I have to read them. You know, I have a staff. Everybody reads it because how can you promote something or talk about something that you don't know? Well, absolutely. And But for, on my end of things, when the publicist or the PR agency finds out that I read the whole book, the guest contacts their publicist and goes, wow, you know, I'm, he read my book, you know, then I get the rest of their clients. It's just well, how it I'll works. The publicist didn't read the book. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Oh, oh, that, <laughs> that I can believe. It changed your life. It changed your life. She didn't read it, but it changed your life. Yeah, but you know what I, when, you know, when I, and, and again, Jeremy, when I read your book, the thing that I kept thinking of was you literally can move into a full blown mentor to so many people who need to learn. But I had a funny thought. How many people have called you or emailed you and, and said, Hey, was that me in your book? Were you, did you say that about me? Because there was some of the things were negative, and I didn't know if you had people contact you thinking that you were pointing the finger at them. Um, no, I mean I did have to tell current clients that it was not about them. You know, I because I, most of the anecdotes are about past clients, so I had to reassure them that um, this is not about you. I love you, and. Thankfully, my clients know my sense of humor and they think it's funny. I have not gotten a client who was mad about this. I mean, some past clients might recognize themselves um, and I hope they do. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I've heard some very positive things about you, Jeremy, and I really have to kind of give you kudos for being the type of publicist working in public relations that want, that wants to do the right thing, not just for their client, not just for your clients, but the message that you bring out, you're, you're bringing truth, you're being honest, you're sincere, you're genuine. And that is something that's extremely rare in our industry. Well, I always say, and thank you, by the way, those, those are very kind words. Um, part of the book is, you know, we are so uh, busy being outraged that we're now looking for things to be outraged about. And I want the book to be honest, but funny. And let's pop balloons and say, you know what? What we do is not brain surgery. It's not. This is, I think we do a good thing. And I think we bring uh, awareness to clients that we believe in and we like, and we want them to succeed. But we can't take ourselves so seriously. Let's all sit back, laugh, have fun. And that's the other thing. There's a whole chapter called why media isn't fun anymore. Because everybody's so busy taking themselves seriously and looking to cancel other people. And so, you know, passionate. And these are my values. And if you don't believe in it, you're the villain. Come on, let's just laugh. <laughs> no, I agree. We need to laugh, but we also need to learn to laugh at ourselves yes. because that's what makes life well, worth living. And when Thanks. it comes to media, I get tired of, I don't even know if I want to call them a journalist because I don't even know if they have that right to use that term, but to act like they have a vendetta against mankind and splitting us all into subgroups. And then, you know, it, it's weird because what, not even 10 years ago, everybody was saying, you know, we need to be colorblind. All of our blood is the same color, but now we're, 
in subgroups staring at each other saying, end racism, but let's look at the pigment of our skin. And, you know, I, it's it's such a it's it's such hypocrisy. I mean, one of my favorite things is to defund the police. You know what? I, I actually quipped to someone. I said, you know what? It's a great Christmas uh, present this year is a gift card to call the police because they've been defunded. So now if someone breaks into your house or mugs you, they don't have money. But here's a gift card. <laughs> you know, like this, this is the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life. If anything, you give them more money, better training, more uh, ways to identify bias to, I don't know, pay people more, get a better crop of law enforcement. But no, let's take away money. I mean, these some of these cops in New York City are making 35000 a year, which is poverty in New York City, right? Here's a gun and go into that community who don't, they already don't like you. Oh, and, and now we're going to take money away from you. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's totally crazy. And, I, you know, and here's the thing. The public, and I should say the media needs to stop it. We ourselves are not police officers. No. You know, if we were put in the same situation, what would we do? Your adrenaline is going. I mean, I talked to a former military guy that is was in a particular group that is above Navy SEAL, above Green Beret. I mean, and he told me 24 hours a day, your adrenaline inflows. When you, you are instantly thrown into a situation you do not delay. You don't think you do because if you if you even think someone dies, and well, I always like if 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 I were a cop and you know I'm a scaredy cat, like everything scares me. <laughs> um, if if you said here's thirty five thousand dollars, here's a gun. Oh my god, that community, um, you know, big gunfight. I'd be outside Seven Eleven going. <laughs> I can't hear you. <laughs> There's no way I'm going in there. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, exactly. And yeah, the whole the whole thing. I think you're right. You know, out of all of the narratives in the last, gosh, I want to say at least the last eight years, have been so over the top, completely so the top. ignorant, stupid. We can just keep yeah. putting labels on it. But like you said, the public is smart. The public in that area understands what the truth really is. They may not, they may fall for the celebrity clickbait, but when it right. comes to the matters that really matter the most, they get it. Unfortunately, I, they're just not able to speak out without losing their job. And that, you know, and I do feel that media is in a tough spot. Okay. So I started as a journalist and I can tell you it is not a glamorous pr profession. There's no money in it. The hours are hard. Nobody I knew went in with an agenda. We just wanted to report the news, right? That's your job. You're telling stories. You're telling people what happened. Um, for the woke thing, the problem is this is a story. This is part of our culture now. Media has to report on this. But by doing that, you're per perpetuating it. And that's the problem. I don't think media wants to... to to cancel people, but they have to report on it because it's happening. So I do feel like when people are like, oh, media's uh, promote, no, they're reporting on it. But by reporting on it, you're giving it legitimacy. Yeah, and, that, and it's it's just a cesspool. And you know, when the Me Too movement hit, there was a lot of hypocrisy there. Yeah, we know you know, Weinstein was a snake and, and there are others like him. I mean, the casting couch has been around for years and tell you the truth. Right. And I'm not naming names, but some of them who let's say the ones that came in to talk to those people didn't have a problem with the casting couch. So don't be coming out acting like you were taken advantage of when you knew darn well what was going on and what you were walking into and you were just glad to get the part. I agree with some of that. I think what's missing is the bigger picture of why someone has to be in that place in the first place. Yeah. Okay. 
why should a woman even have to think about that? Yeah. It's sexist. It, it's, it's, no, what, it's what auditions are for, not a yeah. hotel room. I can tell you no business is done in someone's hotel room. Okay. Why a woman ha even has to be put in that place to even think about that. And that's because, you know, Hollywood is run by, you know, men, maybe not, not good men. Yeah. Um, it's a sexist industry. And so when someone says, oh, well, she knew better. Well, no, she, no woman should have to be even think about that. Right. And that's no, yeah, the problem. I agree. Yeah, yeah I, I completely agree. I mean, I probably miss word, you know, I probably didn't put it in the right context, but you're, you're correct. Nobody deserves it whatsoever. Yeah. And or even have to even think about that. Like a man is not required to go to someone's hotel room. Okay. Um, but a woman, it, that's even like something she has to consider instead of like, no, I'm a good actress. This is now someone saying, oh, you need that part. Well, no man is being asked to do that. So I think that's the problem we're missing is um, it's a sexist industry and a lot of success has been valued over dignity. Well, you said some things in your book and I, and, and I want to kind of get, I'm going to wrap this up here in a bit. The thing is, is because you've worked so long in New York, what are mm. the differences between working in New York City versus working in LA in the same industry? Um, I think in New York, we have um, a better BS detector. I think we we get stuff done in New York. It's, uh, we tell the truth. Um, you know, we get down to business. There's not a lot of, we don't mince words. Um, in LA, it is a very, um, it, you know, it's, it's, it's a company town. Right, Hollywood runs a town. It's a different culture, and it's not a. I'm not saying it's bad, but it takes a certain type of person to succeed in Hollywood than in New York. Completely different cultures. Um, you know, I've spent time in LA, and you know, uh, it, you can't talk about anything else but Hollywood. Whereas in New York, you can leave and meet friends at the bar and talk about anything. So yeah. I do, I'm not saying it's bad. It's just different for me. Yeah, um, I can see that. I can see that. Well, well, Jeremy, where can everyone watching and listening buy your book F off Chloe surviving the OMGs and FMLs in your media career? Uh, Amazon. It came out on Tuesday. So uh, Amazon, Barnes and Noble, it's even on Target and Walmart. I mean, I have the F word in the title and Walmart selling it. <laughs> Low prices every day. <laughs> well, Jeremy, I want to thank you. Seriously, thank you and sincerely for honoring us with your time, uh, discussing your book, discussing some of the topics that even today's media won't even bring up in a conversation. Right. And uh, I have a lot of uh, friends of mine who have been waiting for this interview because they want to they want to listen to someone that actually works in the industry and hates the very things that we are seeing in the media today so ladies and gentlemen again as jeremy murphy has explained to us about well media and even public relations even if you don't work in the industry you're going to find this book an eye opener you're going to see the truth you're going to literally laugh yourself crazy like I did because I can't wait to read it again because now I'm going to be taking some serious business notes because for <laughs> us, it's a little bit of a business manual in media. So Jeremy, I thank you for that. Thank you for having me. Oh, it's fantastic. And uh, again, hey, much success to you with the brand new book. And Thanks. I myself, well, I'm kind of hoping that uh, you're going to come out with a public relations business manual version in the future. Absolutely. It's, it's, once I recover from this, I'll think about it. <laughs> All right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, Jeremy Murphy, founder of 360 Bespoke, which is a public relations firm in New York City. You can definitely go to the website and check it out. 
And if you need his services, I'm sure you can contact him directly. And as for me, stick around because we'll be right back with more.